Although it's become a bit of a cliche by now, October truly is the best month for scary reads. With the weather shifting and night slowly encroaching ever more on the day, October is just the perfect month to read books that scare you, at least a little. Welcome aboard the International Express to Book Central. Grab a seat, settle in, and let's while away the journey with some book chat. I'm your host Jules, and today I want to share some books with you and one film that really gave me one of those, oh my god, my heart just stopped moments. Sometimes my heart stopped because I got legitimately scared. Other times, however, my heart stopped because the books I'm about to share with you were just so capable of slicing right down to the heart of something. The first book I want to share with you is Nyctophobia by Christopher Fowler. I read a review copy of this book back in 2014, and I have not reread it since, because I remembered the feeling it gave me towards the end, which was just this straight-up cold stab of primal fear running up and down my limbs. <laughs> Nyctophobia is about Callie, who is a young architecture student, and she has married Matteo, who is a wine importer. She has moved into his grand old mansion in Spain called Hyperion House, which is just flooded with light. It also comes with a mute gardener, a creepy housekeeper, and parts of the house that no one has a key for. While she is quite happy there, looking after Matteo's daughter, Callie begins to be drawn to the dark, empty rooms of the house, and she becomes convinced someone is living there. In Nyctophobia, Fowler gets the idea of haunting, the theory of haunting, just perfectly right, which is why the novel works as well as it does. It's really effective. Nyctophobia means fear of the dark, and the whole novel kind of plays with the impossible balance between dark and light, reality and fantasy, as Callie begins to get to know the house better and thereby kind of stops knowing what's going on. <laughs> I seriously do not have any phobias myself, but this made me very suspicious of the dark corners in my bedroom while I was reading it. The novel is also structured pretty nicely, with the beginning really just setting everything up, making sure you know the characters, you understand the house, etc, and then kind of lulling you into a sense of comfort before it just rips the carpet out from under your feet in the end. Callie is also a really interesting and conflicting main character, and you can like agree and disagree with her all in one go, which I consider to be really solid character building. If I can go, why would you do that? Why would you go in there? and simultaneously go, well, I kind of understand why you went in there. That's solid. That makes me want to keep going. Another book that really got to me, in the sense that it was just so horrific, but also so beautiful, is Raw Blood by Catriona Ward. I read this about six years ago, and some of its imagery and its tragedy still just linger in my brain, where every once in a while I'll be like, remember Raw Blood? Dang, that was something. Raw Blood is about Iris Villarcus and her relationship to her family mansion, which is called Raw Blood. It is set during the early 20th century, and Iris lives a pretty reclusive and solitary life at this mansion because she suffers from a congenital heart disease, I think. Ward also tells us the story of Iris's ancestors, non-chronologically, kind of hopping back and forth in time. One of these ancestors is a 19th century doctor who's obsessed with blood, another is a soldier suffering in World War I, there's a woman who may be supernatural, just so much kind of happens in this family, and yet it all comes together to tell the story of raw blood of the mansion, and thereby kind of elucidating what is happening to Iris and why her life is the way it is. You do really have to pay attention in this book, but I found that to be true for all of Catriona Ward's writing so far. She weaves a beautiful, bloody, tragic tapestry in raw blood, and after finishing it, I legitimately first cried, and then just sat there for longer than is maybe polite, and I was just kind of staring and thinking, and I remember exactly where I was. This was when I was living in Shanghai, and I remember sitting in my apartment on the sofa, finishing this book, and staring at the air conditioning unit on the wall going, what did I just read? Why am I in so much pain? <laughs> 
Raw Blood is a horror novel, yes, but the true horror of it lies, I think, in human nature, in kind of our ability to fall in love, to cherish things, to find beauty, but also to die, to betray people, to feel hatred, all those things that we are capable of, which feel paradoxical and yet make up the human experience. While Ward employs all of the horror strategies available, yes, baby. While she does employ all of the horror strategies available, not unlike my cat, it really is a novel about family, and it packs a hell of a punch. Also, it is a bit bloody for those who are into that. And also, also, Catriona Ward has been writing brilliant books ever since, from Little Eve to The Last House on Needless Street, but this was her first one to get published, I believe, and I was just mind blown <laughs> that this could be the first thing you put out there. From horror that leans on real life, we're going to a book that is about real life and filled me with horror. I'm talking about All Quiet on the Western Front or Im Westen Nichts Neues by Erich Maria Remarke. In 2014, I did a blog series about the literature of the First World War because it was the centenary of the war starting. And this is one of the books that was, of course, on my list. Now, sometimes you go into a book knowing that it's a classic for a reason and that it's going to be impactful because that's why it's a classic. And then nonetheless, you sit there, it hits you and you're like, oh, so this is why it's a classic. It's always funny that that can still surprise me. In All Quiet on the Western Front, a group of German schoolboys signs up for the First World War, convinced it will be a glorious and brief experience, which will just fill their life with meaning. From here, the novel then follows Paul Boimer as he begins to experience the real horror and disillusionment of life in the trenches and actual warfare. I think that probably suffices for a summary, as many people will probably be familiar with this book, but also much of it isn't just about the plot. The plot is very basic, but it's about what happens. This book was incredibly popular upon its publication because it spoke so strongly to the experience of so many young men who had just suffered in World War I. The terrible truth that the novel tells is not necessarily that war is pointless or that those making the decisions are wrong, but that what a soldier experiences changes him forever and in many cases destroys them, even if they survive the bombs and bullets. When the novel's protagonist, Paul Boima, returns home on leave from the front, the reader is confronted with this reality, and it just it's brought home really starkly that Sometimes something can happen to you that so drastically changes you, especially when that thing what happens is just a pure destruction of warfare and how it twists something in a person. And this is really one of the most challenging books I read in 2014, but also just thinking back on it. And it's been on my mind frequently since then, especially when I read Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain last year. And I was once again kind of confronted with that break, which the First World War kind of represented. Unlike any other novel that I've read, it really brings that destruction of warfare on a psychological level home to you. Apparently, the Netflix adaptation of this novel is also very good, but so far, Remark's words have still left too strong an impression on me to want to re-experience it all. And now for something completely different. After watching Gone Girl in the cinema, I became obsessed with Gillian Flynn, like most people, and I dove straight into her novel Sharp Objects. There, time came to a screeching halt as my body slowly filled with dread, squeezing my heart to a pulp. Camille Preaker is a journalist, and after a recent stint at a psych hospital, her first assignment is to go back to her hometown and cover the murder of two girls. She's not sure what's worse, the murders or having to live with her mother again. Their relationship is a true definition of abusive, and Camille bears the marks of this on her soul and her body. While Sharp Objects in many ways is a whodunit crime novel, it really is a book about mother-daughter relationships, the relationship women have with themselves and their bodies, sisterhood, and so much more. When I first went into this novel, I expected something slick and neat and kind of cool, like Perfect Amy and Gone Girl, and what I got was something so vivid and so raw that it made me flinch at times. <laughs> There is so much anger and hatred in the pages of this book, but it's all directed inwards in a way I could very much recognize and kind of almost relate to, which was also scary. I also still remember bursting out of my room, running up the stairs and breathlessly telling my university housemate about the ending. And she just sat there going, uh-huh. And I was like, no, you don't understand. You have to read this book. I think something's broken. <laughs> 
This book had its claws in me for days and weeks, and it still kind of does to this day because it's another one I have refused to reread. The limited TV series based on this book is very good though. Amy Adams does a really good job kind of bringing all those repressed emotions to the surface in a way that's believable rather than overly dramatic. I would recommend suffering through the book first though because that's an experience you're not going to get anywhere else. Another book which horrified me, but which I think is a very important read, which is not necessarily advocated for a lot, and I understand that, but the book is Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov. As most people know, this book tells the story of a man in prison for pedophilia. The novel is basically his defense, as he tells us about his life and about his victim Dolores. This book suffers significantly from the way it is marketed and the way that popular cultures kind of picked up the novel, but especially this idea of a Lolita. And yeah, I hate what has been done to the book and and how the way that it is depicted prevents people from actually engaging with the book in a kind of an honest way. Because this book in no way glorifies crimes against children, and that should be obvious to everyone who reads it, but I think a lot of people are put off by it, and by how it's talked about, and by the fact that some people think, well, if this book inspires certain people to do this or say that, then I'm not going to read it, and I'm like, no, <laughs> they're misunderstanding it. They're appropriating something they're not entirely understanding. And this is a difficult read, though, not just for its topic, but that is because of how Nabokov writes it. We're getting the protagonist's own thoughts on his actions, his defense of himself, his interpretation of his actions and their consequences, and Nabokov employs every trick in the literary toolbox to show you the power of language and the power of perspective. He does his very best to put you in the mind of this man, and yes, you can't help but feel tainted in the process. I had that as well. I would be reading and for a second I would be forgetting who is telling me this story. And then when that realization came back, I was like, oh no, oh no, <laughs> get me out. <laughs> but that is the point. This is exactly what Nabokov is trying to kind of teach us, I think, through this book. And maybe he didn't even do that on purpose. Maybe it's one of those things that happens naturally in the process of creating such a book. But really, what he's impressing is that language is incredibly powerful and that it's incredibly important to realize who is telling you the story, to never lose sight of who is talking and what their motivation is. Lolita is a real exercise of reading comprehension, and it can make you a much sharper reader of not just fiction, but everything from news to blog posts, even listening to a podcast like this. It is a horrifying book. It's grotesque in parts, but it is meant to be. You're actually meant to be horrified here, and not in a, ooh, fun, that was cathartic kind of way, but in an, oh no, I need to be paying attention kind of way. And that's a good reminder, I think, for everyone. Another book that is difficult, but stunning, is Claire Fuller's Our Endless Numbered Days, which starts out as a dystopia. Our Endless Numbered Days is about Peggy, who is eight, when her survivalist father takes her to a remote cabin in the German woods when the end of the world hits. There she plays the piano and learns all kinds of survival skills. Eight years later, Peggy returns home to a world which never actually ended. So what happened? What happened in the woods? Who is she now? Why has she come back? So our endless numbered days starts out as a dystopia, and some parts of it almost feel like Robinson Crusoe for its survival information, which is actually quite fun to read. But the novel switches back and forth between Peggy as a child and the Peggy who has returned and is trying to figure out who she is now. While she is trying to figure that out, we as the reader are trying to figure out what happened to that child to turn her into this young woman, and that causes quite a lot of suspense, I would say. While I saw some of the twists coming, I nonetheless had a moment during this book where my stomach just dropped when the full impact of what happened hit me. It's not the easiest read, but one which is really rewarding for how Fuller sketches her characters and how she builds that kind of arc of suspense, I would say. So at the end of this rather eclectic mix of books, I've got another one, which is a movie, so I'm cheating, but this is actually the only movie that has ever actually had me hide behind a pillow, not just for fun, but because I legitimately didn't want to witness what was on the screen. And that film is Fragile. Don't laugh at me. 
Fragile is a Spanish-British horror film from 2005, directed by Balaguero, and it is set at a hospital which is in the process of being closed down. The only patients still there are the children, which doesn't make sense, but we're going with it, and one of these kids suffers from cystic fibrosis, and she's called Maggie. Maggie also just happens to keep seeing a girl or a woman, a she, and that she seems to be haunting the hospital, maybe? And then bones start getting randomly broken. It turns out there's an urban legend about a girl named Charlotte who haunts the hospital. This all gets a lot worse as the real nature of the ghost is revealed and everything kind of starts falling apart. This film isn't actually a masterpiece or anything like that. It's also not necessarily that scary thinking back to it, but it just it's exactly what it needs to be for a horror film. I'm mainly featuring it here as an example of how sometimes a horror film or a book finds you at just the right time when you have some tension to work out, when some catharsis is desperately needed. I watched this on TV with my little sister. I think both of us were a little bit too young for it. And it was just one of those perfect joys of regular TV programming when we didn't have Netflix or anything like that. And you just had to watch what was on TV. And this happened to be on. And we were just sitting there going, oh my God. <laughs> I still remember this film quite fondly at this point, and I have not rewatched it now. Um, I don't know. I think rewatching it now might kind of shatter the beautiful memory I have of it. And, you know, certain plot holes might start standing out to me, and I might be like, mm, no, actually, this wasn't great. And then that would just change the memory a little bit. So I'll leave it as it is. A quick shout out also to last week's episode about the yellow wallpaper, because that was also a story that made me hide my head under a blanket, for real. And also shout out to the book I'm planning to cover in two weeks time, The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, which is an absolute classic, which breaks my heart. So look forward to that episode. And tell me what your favorite scary read is. And that is it for today. If you have questions, thoughts on the book, or recommendations or requests for future episodes, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email at bookcentralpod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. You can also subscribe to be informed when new episodes drop. You can find references to the materials used today in the description. Book Central is written and produced by me, and our music is by Scott Buckley. Thank you for joining me today on the International Express to Book Central.